Working Cows Podcast, episode 251. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. It's Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, powered by the Global Ag Network. And just wanted to say thanks again uh, for all the kind words after episode 250. Uh, Thank you to all those who called in and shared their thoughts. Really appreciate that. It was a pretty pretty fun episode. If you haven't had a chance to catch it, go back and listen to that. I'm very excited to be joined today by Dan Rasmussen. Dan is uh, an educator for the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. I said this in the outro to uh, episode 250, uh, but if you don't stick around for those, uh, say it again here. South Dakota Grassland Coalition is a very uh, great organization. Um, they've been on the cutting edge, uh, forward thinkers for a long time. I think Dan said he's been a, a board member of theirs for 18 years, and so um, was a board member now taking this this position as an educator. So they've been doing this for a long time as far as kind of leading this conversation about soil health and grazing. And, and they spun off, I think, maybe what was a first in the nation as far as the Soil Health Coalition, South Dakota Soil Health Coalition. We've talked to Cindy Zink from uh, that organization before, as well as some um, people who've been fe- featured in different publications of theirs throughout the years as well. So um, just a really forward-thinking organization. They've got some grazing schools coming up. Uh, Lord Lord willing, if this comes out on Monday, uh, one of those is this week, but uh, got another one coming up in September that you could uh, also take part in. So uh, if you're looking for that, um, just knowing the quality of that organization over the years would be encouraging uh, you to maybe consider that as an option if you're looking for a place to attend some some different continuing education. So um, I think with all that being said, I just welcome Dan to the show. Dan, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Hey, I'm happy to be here, Clay. So gotten connected to you uh, through, actually, the first time I met you was at a South Dakota Grassland Coalition event that um, you were helping to organize uh, that Dr. Tom Nofsinger was speaking at, and uh, and then um, have crossed paths with you a couple other places, uh, but have kind of really been interested in, in your story and, and your context, where you're at in the world, and then kind of the history of management of the place that you're on and and how that transition has gone. And, and I'd like to talk to you today about kind of the steps uh, or the, the process, the journey that you've been on towards uh, improving the management on your place. So could you kind of describe to us a little bit of your context, and then we'll we'll talk about that journey. Sure. So right now I'm I'm uh, splitting my time between ranching on our family ranch in Millet County and uh, being the education coordinator with the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. The uh, um, this ranch here, the 33 ranch in uh, Millet County, is where I grew up. And it's a family operation, and so I've been on the board of the Grassland Coalition for 18 years, and then when we received a grant to start a um, consulting program with the grazing school, the schools that we put on, I, uh, I, I resigned from the board and, uh, and, and took the job of, uh, of, of getting that organized and going and managing the consultants. Uh, we've got what uh, 85 ranches signed up in the last three and a half years and we've gotten completed 60 and we have to have the rest of them done by September. So anyway, and we have a new grant to keep going. So uh, going back a ways, um, I ended up in in uh, Southern Africa in 1980, teaching agriculture uh, at farm management at a college there, working with extension agents. And uh, and that was, uh, that really opened my eyes to the value of education. Uh, I lived uh, in, in a communal area and uh, the college was, and so we worked with extension agents that were working with farmers and ranchers that were moving from a communal 
type uh, type sub- subsistence to improving their crops and their rangelands. And uh, I so a- and at that time I was pretty much a high production individual, and uh, I moved came back to the to work with my dad in '82, and I was still thinking high production was the right way to go, and and ended up talking him into buying. Uh, some crossbred cows that uh, didn't work very well. They weren't adapted to our ranch or mm. too big, too much milk. And so that was my, that was, that was one of my two big regrets was uh, not understanding what nature wanted from us here. And, and that was my, uh, a lot of times we learn from our mistakes that, uh, that now I understand a little more about nature and I understand that nature can really uh, uh, throw you a, a hard punch if you're uh, not paying attention. And so now uh, we have uh, smaller cows that are adapted, low milk. Uh, they can lactate through the winter. We often wean in in, uh, in February, first February, late January. We wean when the cows tell us it's time. Uh, we rotate in the winter. We calve in May. You know, we just just these observing nature and working with nature. Uh, and, uh, and I think another way, another, and, and a, a more recent observation for me in the last 10 years is how important soil health is. Mm. Sure. The health of our soil is, is our future value. Could you talk to me a little bit about the ecological context of the actual 33 ranch, um, where is it in the world and what, what's kind of uh, the ecology of, of the, where the ranch finds itself? Yeah, if you go to, uh, we're, I, don't know, I, I guess I'm not sure annual rainfall average is in the 15-inch range, you know, 15 or 16, I think. And often we get nine, and very seldom do we get 25, you know, <laughs> like once every 20 years or something. But uh uh, and, and NRCS puts us here at about 0.45 AUMs, which would be pretty close to 24 acres a year on a season-long graze thing for a cow. So, you know, that's, the, that's that part of it. Um, we, our, our actual stocking rate now, after 30 years of, rota- of uh, having a rotation, is in the 0. 0.75, 0. 0.8 range on average. And uh, so we've we've increased, yeah, maybe it's 0.7. So we've increased uh, 25% to 30% in our stocking rate, and uh, and 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 understanding that that I know, and it, it humbles me when I look at think about where we could be, and we're limited by our resources, labor, and and finance, and and uh, and stuff. So we can talk more about that in a bit but uh the uh, um the potential is for for increasing stocking rate is tied absolutely to soil health the uh now our ranch now is is it has way healthier soil than it did in 1985 when we were you know the, the ranch had been season long grazed since 1914 and and there is there is an area on the ranch that had been used as a winter pasture. It's uh, the name we use for it is Cedar Butte, and there's a thousand Cedar Buttes across the countryside. But uh, but this one's ours, and uh, it hadn't been summer grazed, you know, for many many decades. And uh, so that's kind of the the baseline I use is to bring the rest of the pastures in line with with uh, the organic matter the fo- water infiltration the um the the um, species diversity with that area and and so that's as untouched uh and is least impacted by grazing area that we have uh, yeah. and so anyway yeah. that's the uh, that that's kind of gives you a little background. Yeah, an interesting insight. So um, we're sitting here in in July of 2022, and um, 
2020 was fairly dry. 2019 was exceptionally wet. I don't know if it was the same for you, but 2019 in my neighborhood was exceptionally wet. We were kind of in that same area, 16, 15, 16 inches of rain uh, in 2020. Or 2019, we got 40. Uh, and then in 2020, we got nine. And um, we're somewhere, we're on pace to get about that again this year in 2022, I guess. So um, in 2020, 2020, 2021, and 2022, we've kind of all been in that nine inches or so. And so my neighbor ended up having to use his winter pasture for summer pasture last year. And we haven't had these big, heavy, wet snows when the ground is still frozen. And I've got uh, one dam on my place. And that dam almost butts, almost touches. When it's full, it probably does touch my neighbor's fence but it comes off of his winter pasture. And what I've noticed is that since we haven't had those heavy, wet spring snows when the ground is still frozen, that that water hasn't run off. And we've had some big rains, but because it butts up against my neighbor's summer pasture, um, or my my neighbor's old winter pasture, uh, there isn't runoff from that pasture unless the ground is frozen. When the ground is, is thawed, that ground, because it's been winter pasture for so long, will take that that rain in. So I drive around the countryside and I see other people's dams, uh, similar in size to mine, um, that are in in summer pastures. And these are places that are three or four miles from me that have had similar rainfall patterns, but their dams are full because they're those dams are in summer pastures where the water has run off, does run off because it's season long grazing. So I I think I'm I'm just trying to lend credence to what you're saying about that that winter pasture being kind of the baseline or the place to to start looking as far as what is our soil health target, <laughs> you know, and 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 improving everything else that's been season long grazed for that. Is that does that insight line up with what you're what you're saying? Do you feel? Yeah, absolutely. And in the big picture, you know, just let's say South Dakota is our uh, it, it, we have a South Dakota map and, and you could find, if you find the worst soil structure, soil health would be a, uh, a tilled bean field, soybean field. And the best would be a pasture that has uh, a, a wide diversity of native plants. You know, it's 40% big blue stem, 30% um, Western wheatgrass, 20% side oats, grama, you know, that kind of thing. And where it has what nature intended for our soil, a uh, uh, high organic matter and, uh, and, and good root structure. Well, that bean field, um, I can pull up videos and show you water running off bean fields into pastures, into well-managed pastures. And then you go to the down he'll go downstream to where the water comes out of the pasture and it's a trickle. You know, instead of sheets coming off of that unhealthy, sad situation in the bean field, we have this clean, wonderful water trickling out of the bottom of the grassland. And uh, so it's, it, you know, it's really uh, that right there is gives me goosebumps <laughs> that I can manage something that is that healthy and that that uh, pristine and and uh, so and 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 we can make it better and we can keep making it better and uh, we just by learning and so I've got a uh, on the screen here we're doing this on a Zoom I've got a line graph that we use and I use it in in a presentation at the at the grazing schools and. It, it, so, Clay, if you look on the left side, this line goes across the page horizontally. And on the left side, it says season long overgrazing. And on the right side, it says management intensive grazing. So we are all on that line somewhere in between. And if you're and, and so as you move to the right, the soil gets healthier. So if you go to, from season long grazing to slow rotation, over time, the soil will become healthier. And, you, and then you go to a faster rotation, 
you know, and instead of six weeks or two months to a to a, a move, you're at four weeks, then the soil gets healthier again. And and as you s- s- increase the the, the um, recovery time and the cattle are in the pasture for a shorter period of time and longer recovery, the soil gets healthier again. And so what is healthy soil? Well, healthy soil is um, increasing organic matter, increasing uh, water infiltration, increasing plant diversity, and what goes along with that is increasing stocking rates. So I really respect people that are in the uh, one-day moves. They're, uh, I know ranches that are doing that, and I, and a lot of ranches that are doing that are, are managing their resources really well, and they're able to, but they may not even be able to do that on the whole ranch. You know, it might be one pasture. It, on a 3,000 acre ranch, it might be 900 acres or 1,500, but that land will be much healthier than the slow rotation. And uh, so what, what moves us to the right on this, so let's go back to the left side, season long over grazing, everything is going backwards. Organic matter is decreasing. Soil or the water infiltration is decreasing. Plant diversity is decreasing. So over time, you start seeing these 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 uh, um, decreases in soil health, and of course, the stocking rate should be decreasing as long as soil health is decreasing. So, so at the grazing schools, what we teach is how to move to the right on this line, and 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 the way the the process that that is really works well is holistic resource management. Uh, HRM for short, and this was coined by Alan Savory. And it is, uh, there are instructors around the country that uh, come in, can come in and, and, and teach these classes. But what it does is it just make, it has you look at the people, the, the production, the finances, and the ecology of the land. And all of them are equally important. These are the four pillars of HRM. They're all equally important. When you move one, you you affect them all. So on this line, when you move to the right, you start managing more intensively, it's going to affect something else, finances or people, um, the labor. The, um, or, and and uh, so we, the, the HRM gives us a, a structure and a framework to organize that. I was at a pasture walk in about 15 years ago and alan savory was the guest the guest host and so he alan savory the guy from zimbabwe uh led us through this pasture walk and at lunchtime i sat down ate lunch with him and i asked him what was your uh what do you feel was your biggest contribution over your lifetime because he you know he's pushing 80 yeah uh and he said uh he said hrm he said no question because it, it gives you a structure to manage complexity. And he said, ranches are so complex that we tend to focus in one area that we like the most or gives us the most, what we feel like the mm-hmm. biggest response. And yeah. uh, and so anyway, maybe that's enough about that, but. Uh, no, I like it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I had a, a call this morning in the providence of God from a friend of the uh, Working Cows podcast, um, Aaron Helmick, and he's in West Virginia and uh, doing some really neat things there and, and just really appreciate his heart and his his desire uh, to manage all aspects, family, uh, people, uh, money, land, animals well. And, and he, he kind of was making the point that a lot of times we um, – we talk about these big, flashy, splashy practices, uh, one day moves, you know, or, or even more, more intense rotations than that. Um, but we don't talk about, you know, the plan of, of surviving, (laughs) uh, (laughs) to get there. And so I, I think that that's a, an important, that's an important, uh, a piece, uh, of this conversation is to, uh, talk about the journey, talk about the process of going from 
the left side of that graph, season-long overgrazing, to uh, the right side of that graph, um, and wherever kind of the the people or the the resources uh, that you have available to you will allow you. However far. Uh, the resources that you have available to you will allow you to go. So could you just maybe even give me an example from your own ranch there uh, in South Central South Dakota uh, about the process that you guys have gone through? Uh, what was kind of the 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 bubble pop, the p- paradigm challenge, uh, the paradigm shift moment, and then kind of the process from there to uh, where you are today and, and maybe even where you're where you feel like you should be moving and and where you would like to get in the future yeah yeah sure um so i mentioned earlier that that i was a production person in the 80s and i was uh, following a lot of recommendations for higher production and they did they weren't working you know they just weren't we i was fighting nature and fighting nature and um i do think you know so once that uh that shifted and the thing that shifted it for me was bootstraps the bootstraps program and which is based on hrm and uh so that that was put together by uh dave stefan and, and barry dunn and barry had been through a uh, alan savory hrm course already in the 80s before and he helped put that together and that uh uh, that that was just a, a game changer. It just I, I it just turned me on my heel, and I realized that if we don't work with nature, we're going to be fighting a battle. And uh, so that that was a cool change. Um, so then it was a learning thing. Go to every I went to every school I could find, and uh, and 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 took away a lot of good stuff. But what became very clear for me was that everybody every ranch is unique and we shouldn't be looking to other places and comparing ourselves because we, we all have different resources. Um, I really like a, there's a saying, a quote, and I, Theodore Roosevelt claimed it. Um, Henry Thoreau claimed it, there, but, but it says that um, comparison, a quote, comparison is the thief of joy, mm. end quote. And what that's saying is that that if we compare ourselves and, and live, our, our our joy is based on comparison to other people, that we're going to lose our joy. Well, this is kind of the same thing. We really need to focus. The focus isn't on what somebody else is doing. It's on and comparing. Can we keep up? It is, or are we better or, or not or, or, or not? It is what resources do we have? That's our focus. And how can we apply those in the most efficient way? And that right there is a definition of HRM. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Yeah. First Timothy six, six says godliness with contentment is great gain. That's the same, same idea that we're, if we're comparing ourselves with other people, if we're not content with what we have, (laughs) We're mm-hmm. we're not going to be we're going to end up chasing things and costing ourselves a lot of hardship and money and other things. <laughs> yeah, that's so. it, it, yeah, it's a wonderful passage. It is it, it as long as we can keep our focus on our on what we have and where and our goals, uh, then we can be happy, be happier. The um, and our goals are, are are really important. And so on this ranch, uh, my partner, brother-in-law, Blake Lehman, and I went through the Ranching for Profit School in the late 90s. Um, and it's just one of the many schools we've been through. And uh, I, I, I've been fortunate all my life for at, at a lot of different stages. Um, the, uh, the, my, my dad was a very good uh, conservation rancher, but he was season-long grazing. And when um, when I started rotating pastures, his comment or his statement was a very flat, it won't work. Uh, two years later, three years later, I wasn't going fast enough for him. He saw the he, he saw the, the 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 successes and he immediately turned on his heel and said, 
let's go, let's go faster. This is good. This is, this is having an impact. And yep. so, so I was very fortunate there. A lot of people, a lot of, of young folks don't get that. Right. They get resistance and the resistance is hard. You have to then uh, factor that in and, and, uh, but, but uh, actually my father was in the room the same day that uh, with uh, Dave Stefan and Barry Dunn, when they made that decision to, to begin a bootstraps program. Right. And uh, there were several other people in the room too, but uh, yeah. Like, like I said, there's a journey, there's a process here that we'd, we'd like to document. And I think that one of the, like I said, we, we talk about these big splashy headline things, um, you know, that make a, make a lot of people really excited and, oh, we want to, you know, move this often or whatever, but back to the holistic resource management, managing your resources holistically. Um, if you have four small kids and, um, you know, and a wife and, and all these other things going on, maybe moving four times a day isn't for you now. Maybe when the kids are older, maybe when the kids are gone and you're looking for something to do, <laughs> maybe then four, four moves a day is, will be for you. But I think that's, that's one of those kind of uh, paradigm shifts that we need to have is not where do I want to be, not uh, what, what looks good on a YouTube video, not what looks good on a Facebook post, but where am I now and how do I manage everything I have, not just the soil, but everything I have well now so that my kids don't hate the ranch, <laughs> you know, and, and some of those things. So I, I think that all of that me meshes with what you're talking about. There was a few years there that we were trying to do everything. We were trying to hay, calve earlier, be a, um, rotate, and again, working against nature. But uh, it so then you learn to prioritize. And on this ranch, we prioritized uh, calving in May and pasture rotations and cut a lot of other stuff out. So no more farming, no more haying, you know, calving later, letting the cows do more of the work, calve the heifers in the pasture, you know, check them a few times a day. And that uh, that opened the door to be able to 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 pursue uh, subdividing pastures, water development, you know the things that the things that that are needed to uh, to move from left to right on this imaginary line that we've got. Right. So yeah, let's go back to this this line. Um, what was the first change that you you guys made on your ranch? Well, we were in the season-long take half, leave half uh, part there, and so things were decreasing. You know, the we were we were seeing. Uh, well, okay, so now we have a lot less cactus. We have a lot more plants per square foot. We have um, healthier healthier soils, uh, healthier plants, more diversity. We got. Uh, we those season long pastures, grazed pastures, had very little uh, warm season grasses in them, and because they'd been grazed so hard all summer for so long, and and um, our and we grazed twelve months out of the year, and uh, and so the winter pastures looked pretty good, but summer pastures didn't. And now our some now we our hope is that we can our goal is that we can use these pastures. Any pasture can be a winter pasture. Any pasture can be a summer pasture, and that takes a lot of planning. And we're not there yet, and uh, because you have to have winter water and you have to have a protection, a plan for protection. Um, so, so you just keep we just keep working at it. But the um, what we saw to answer your question what, what happened within a few years the uh, warm seasons were back mm -hmm. and now we have some pastures are 50 percent warm seasons wow and yeah so we're we're in a, another thing you know maybe it's you could call it an unfair advantage is uh what you know if you might drive by the badlands and see these badland pastures and say look at all that land that's that's not usable well 
the nice thing about it is when this uh, sediment kind of erodes off of those chalky buttes, that's a great uh, soil for uh, environment for warm season plants. Mm. So we get a lot of warm season plants growing in those uh, overflow sites. And uh, so this, yeah, we're in that, that warm season, that, that clay, cool season um, soils and sandy or warm season. We, we have both in almost every pasture. In, in Western South Dakota, um, I think Dave Olala said, you know, we're dominated by cool seasons here, you know, probably 85, maybe upwards of 90% cool season mm-hmm. grasses in most of Western South Dakota. It, it, do you, would you say that's a management issue more than it is an environment issue? Well, you know, <laughs> nature is very complex and there are a lot of variables. So you have to speak from a soil type uh, classification standpoint um, it's a little harder to grow warm season grasses in real clay soils, gumbo soils. Not impossible at all. It's very possible. And uh, intensive grazing with hoof action brings that in. It, it, uh, but sandier soils are, are uh, warm season grasses like a little more. Um, so um, it, it's, it's just... Um, the 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 healthier the soil the more diversity that that's a a, a direct relationship um, and the way to get soil healthy is to have cattle on it and give it plenty of rest yep in western south dakota right yeah. yep and so your your first change would you say you went from take uh, season long take half leave half to uh, were you in a fast rotation or a uh, no, we where, started slow, started on a slow rotation and, uh, and then moved to a more, um, you know, just moved along to, to faster and faster. And once you figure, once you start subdividing pastures, another thing happens, it creates opportunity for a lot of stuff, you know, that you didn't, couldn't do before. You know, my dad and I tried May calving in, the, in the late eighties and we couldn't keep the bulls in. Well, we didn't understand how to use electric fence. Well, now we have electric fence around a crested wheatgrass field, and we can hold 25 bulls without any problem in uh, in June and July. And we couldn't do it then. We just didn't know how. Mm. Um, so now that we've, you know, we have more pastures, we we can we can do things like that. We've got uh, we can run open heifers with our yearling steers and keep them away from the neighbors just through the grazing plan and plan it out so that they're, they're not running against a neighbor's fence, smaller the paddocks, the easier that is to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And so what was the, you said your dad saw the changes and said, you know, we need to go faster. (laughs) Um, What was, what were kind of some of the next steps on the journey? What were, it was just more, uh, subdivision and water development or what are, what are, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got this graph up now, which, you know, is, is a very simple thing. It just shows that, that, uh, once you start, uh, uh, making these changes, a lot of times the changes happen in the soil. And, uh, so you can't really see it. You might, you know, stocking rates, shouldn't go up the first year. You know, you, you subdivide four or five pastures because it's going to take a while. We've been mining nutrients out of the re- out of the soil for, for decades. Can't expect things to, to get better immediately. And this little graph that, that you and I are looking at on my screen here shows that for the first three years, nothing happens with production. Nothing changes. Now, so let's look at, and then, it slowly the curve starts to go up on year four you see a little more production on year five more and by year six you got a lot more production well so let's talk about what's actually happening in those first three years first three years the soil organic matter is starting to develop and build the biology is growing in there you're putting armor on the soil which protects it and the plants are now uh, planning ahead and they're, they're, they're popping up uh, runners up through that 
that litter. And so now you're on year two or three, you've got six plants per square foot instead of four, you know, or three. And, and, and the soil organic matter is going up. So, and then, so let's talk about what do you do in those first three years? So you, now you're out fencing and you got cattle in a bigger herd next to the road and people are, you know, you're, hay, you're, you're haying your uh, hay fields, quit haying, change your calving date to May. And your neighbors are going, what in the heck are you doing? Well, we're, you know, we're rotating more. We're, you know, we're doing this. And they say, well, so how's that going for you? Oh, pretty good. Uh, stocking rate go up? Well, no. Um, hmm, so uh, why are you doing it? <laughs> well, we're only on year one. You get to year two. Same question, same answer. Get to year three. So, how do you survive that? And 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 uh, I went through it, and I had I had very good friends caution me that I could go broke. You know, very possible. By the time we got to year four, it was really clear this was working. And uh, year five was better. Year six was better. We get out to to ten, and these droughts are no longer a big item. You know, there it's a drought. Yeah, we so we, we we couldn't run our yearlings as long. We uh, kind of called a few more cows. You know, but we had we still have grass, and when it rained, the grass just took off like a bandit. You know, it uh, that's soil health. That's healthy soil, and I would like I would say we we're fifty percent on this journey. We've been at it for thirty years. And uh, <laughs> I thought we'd get farther along, but we have limited resources. So uh, I would, uh, but we do have healthy soil, much healthier. This last drought was uh, much easier to go through. Um, and I'm seeing that in, in ranches I, I go through and visit. Uh, we were at one last summer, we did a pasture walk at Pat Guptel's and he, uh, where he intensive grazes, there were no cracks in the ground. Mm. And he documents the number of plants that he has per square foot on that. I think it was a thousand acres or 900 and uh, <clears throat> moving three times a day, I, I believe, or at least once a day. And uh, so the, the plant numbers has gone up. So is, so is the stocking rate, you know, but it took a few years. There was that lag time. And so you have to be prepared. And one of the ways to survive that lag time is to have a community of people doing the same thing. And that's where the Grassland Coalition comes in with uh, different schools and, um, and, and, and mentors. Definitely. Um, and you're describing the last three years of my life. So I'm I moved here in 2019 <laughs> um, in, uh, let me see, I think it was in May May of 2019, we, uh, nope, it would have been May of 2020, we implemented uh, the management intensive grazing, uh, brought in some outside yearlings and, and a few pairs and did daily moves uh, through from the end of May to the end of August of 2019. And then in 20, or sorry, 2020. And then in 2021, uh, the drought, we, we had a drought in 2020. 20, but it didn't feel like it because of 2019. So then 2021 hits and, um, we are only on our second year of this. And so we drastically reduced the number of outside cattle we brought in and, um, we used half the ranch. And, um, then this year, um, we kind of in March anyways, all the way through the end of April, really, it looked like, um, we were in for another year of, you know, drastically reduced production. So we didn't bring in any outside cattle. <laughs> and act, as a matter mm -hmm. of fact, sent our, our cattle to Nebraska in December. And uh, so we've just got a few sheep and some horses and some goats <laughs> and a couple of actually yearlings that my daughter won in a drawing. So <laughs> bred heifers. Now, actually, they're not yearlings. They're bred heifers. But anyways, that's what we've got on our place right now. It's just some horses, a few sheep, a few goats, and a, and a couple of bred heifers. And um, you know, but then it turned around, uh, in April, the end of April and May was really good, actually above average for us. And, and June was pretty good as well. So, um, you know, it's, 
we we hadn't gotten to that place where we were seeing the increased production necessarily. Although even this year, I'm noticing uh, green needle grass. I hadn't noticed that before. I don't know if that was because I didn't know what I was looking at or because it's just this is the first year it was there. But I'm noticing some significant increases of green needle grass in my in my part of the world. So I think that that just knowing that that lag time exists and and knowing that it's there is an important part of that journey so 10 years from now when you the next drought you know or or the second we go through two more droughts <laughs> 10 years from now right you're uh, you're gonna have more cattle in your place uh when we get to this point because your soil is going to be so much healthier um this whole idea of water infiltration and uh, documenting it and monitoring it really helps you see the progress your ranches are making because we can't see in the soil, you know, dig a hole and observe. But uh, uh, the uh, I was just uh, working at the Ranching for Profit young adult school we put on in here on the Grassland Coalition put on and. And uh, one afternoon, we spent the afternoon going around uh, a, a native pasture and doing water infiltration. And here's an example um, on a field uh, that that is a no-till field. That it was and probably not no-tilled very well, I would guess, because there wasn't much litter and it was pretty compacted. It, it uh, there was it took a long time for the a quart of water to go in. I, I believe it was uh, 15 minutes or something. Then we went to uh, um, right next to it to, in the natives. There was brome isn't a native, but there was a patch of brome that took 13 minutes or nine minutes, nine minutes for a court to go in. And where there was a big patch of big blue stem, it took 90 seconds. So on a two inch rain event, the um, on the field, the no-till field, which is no-till is, a, is, is a, a positive management thing, but the water is going to run off and erode and, and uh, it's going to take a long time for it to soak in. On that this particular one, on the, the brome grass, uh, same thing, long time. On the native, it ran right in. And uh, that's a that's huge. You know, that's a, a huge thing. And we want to be able to keep all the rainfall on our property. And uh, I, one of the things you give up when your soil starts to become more of a sponge and holding this is water in your dams. But what you get in return is grass growing much longer after a rain, you know, because it's holding that, that water. We, uh, all the beavers are, many of the beavers are gone. They, they were very good at holding the water in these draws. And, uh, and now we understand, I understand that was a mistake to, to eliminate, eradicate beavers. Um, they are a, a healthy part of the system. And some people are concerned about the beavers killing trees. They like their trees, but over the long haul, there'll be more trees. And that's been proven over and over again. It, uh, but that brings the springs back to life. And uh, we want that. We want that water to, to stay. Right. Yeah. No, it, it, <clears throat> that is very true. You just, and, and I, I, you know, another question that you get a lot is, are the hoppers there yet? Do you have the hoppers? Well, I think, as we said, when we talked to Bart Carmichael, just a couple of episodes ago, hoppers are, grasshoppers are attracted to a stressed out plant. And so, if we've got that water holding capacity, that plant is uh, not as easily and not as quickly stressed out. And so it takes longer for those grasshoppers to really make an impact. I think um, would that jive with your experience? Yeah, it does. You know, we quit haying here uh, 15 years ago, I believe. And we haven't had much for grasshoppers since. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna, I'm not an entomologist. I'm not going to say, that I understand the life cycle of a grasshopper and how it relates to, uh, to, you know, infestations and, and their breeding cycle and when they lay eggs and, and all, but I do know they lay eggs on bare ground. That's what they prefer. Mm. And if your pasture is, is a, 
a mat of, of grass plants, healthy grass plants, healthy soil, I think we'll have much less of a problem with grasshoppers. That's good. I appreciate that insight. The haying question, you said you stopped haying uh, 15 years ago. Um, then did it become, uh, were you, my, the way that I've always thought that that might should work <laughs> is that we stop haying, but we graze our hay fields in the summer because it's going to be dominated by uh, plants that are adapted to a summer harvesting event. Um, yeah. And then, and then hopefully over time we can transition that into just another one of the pastures in the rotation. But is that, does that fit with your experience in the, in this process? Yeah. And that's, you know, the, the, the hay ground, when, when we cut that hay, we take the hay off. We have mined resources out of the soil. If you do that for a hundred years, you end up with some pretty unhealthy soil. Now, some people will go back and feed that hay back on that ground, which helps. You get the cow's manure and the litter leftover residual. That's a good That's a good plan. Um, in our hay grounds, we weren't able to feed back on them and uh, on all of them. But for the most part, those we, we've done a, a rotation through there, through those now for these years with uh, yearlings. Last summer, I clipped and weighed uh, 2,100 pounds on one of these hay ground, these hay fields that's been grazed for 15 years. Now, that means I put a hoop on the, on the ground, a little hoop, and uh, clipped the grass inside, put it in a paper bag, and put it on my uh, pickup uh, uh, seat. And when it was dry, air dried, I weighed it, and mm. there was 2,100 pounds there. Uh, so in my neighborhood, there was uh, most people last summer didn't even cut their fields wow. because they had what I would guess is about 500 pounds. Yeah, yeah. that'd be my, my estimate. So 500 to 1,000 or you know less. So what we're seeing is this thing, this, this soil is becoming healthier and it has a ways to go. There's no question. I do infil- infiltration rates on it. And uh, 15 years ago, it was uh, it was uh, 40 minutes, and across the road on uh, Native, it was like a minute and a half, two minutes. Mm-hmm. Now it's we we've done them here in the last three years, and it it it's down to 12 minutes or 15 minutes. We have a long way to go there. We've and we could speed it up with the more uh, the more intensive, the more hooves we get on there. We've had up to 600 yearlings in a in a bunch on there over the years and moved them every day and this is helping this is moving us uh the direction we want to go it's getting better every year so so just to take that another step um i moved those yearlings last summer so they left 1100 pounds and that's a real important Mm. thing to that's standing forage and that's the protection for the soil that's going to catch snow when it goes down on the ground, it's going to, uh, it's, it's going to feed the bugs in the soil and it's going to cover the bare ground so that it's cooler and the bugs can work longer and, and create organic matter. If we were moving four times a day, we'd speed this thing up much faster. And, uh, we'd be pushing that, that standing 1000 pounds down onto the soil and, um, so it's you know it's it uh, like I say it humbles me to think of where we could be with you know with with the, the resources but but we're we're in a good place you know I'm in a good place I'm seeing a lot of a lot of pastures around the state that are you know that that, that are are rotating in the f- fast rotation and really seeing some good results uh, yeah so then how do you handle supplementation or, or hay feeding if there is any that happens and, and acquiring hay on a year like last year when we saw uh, hay prices over $400 a ton? Talk to me about that. Well, we buy hay um, and we keep our calves, so they need some hay. We're certified organic. We keep our heifer calves organic and our steer calves uh, commodity NHTC. So, but, so all we can feed the organic calves is, is hay, organic hay. And, um, 
And, and we buy that from an organic producer that's about 18 miles away. And, uh, and, and I, I ran the numbers in 1996 on the set, built a little formula, what it costs us to put up hay. We were at a point where our equipment was old and we needed to start updating. And so I ran that through this formula and it said we could, it was going to cost us $50 a ton uh, just to put our own hay up and I could buy it for 50. So that freed us by doing that, that freed us up to put more energy into rotation, into our rotation and calving in May, we just have to spend some time with the cattle in May and June. And so that opened that door and, uh, and our, um, yeah. So it, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge, uh, but it's still, now we, it would cost us, you know, I ran that hay cost calculator a few years ago and I was in the 85, it would cost us to put it up and we're, we were paying 95 then. And this year it looks like it's going to be, you know, it's going to, it's going to be over a hundred for sure. And, right. uh, so, however, when you back that up and look at the opportunity cost of grazing that or putting those yearlings out in a pasture, you're um, um, paying for pasture. It, 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 it really looks a lot better. And the benefits that we have from focusing our energy on uh, rotations is, uh, has been really valuable. I don't know how you put a dollar figure on that. But and, we've drought tolerance and, right. and soil health and increased carrying capacity. Yep. And that that ninety five dollars or whatever a ton for to put up your own hay according to the hay cost calculator is only if you're able to calculate all of the unforeseen, you know, breakdowns. You know, it, <laughs> average is only average for, you know, it's average because some years it's above that and some years it's below that. It's not because it's that every year. And some, so it, it isn't always going to pan out that that even works out to that. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit because it's relevant to my place uh, and just to satisfy my own curiosity is, um, have you noticed a difference in species on these hay fields when you're grazing them kind of at the same time of year you would have been haying them? Are you notice a difference in species changing, or is it just uh, a difference in uh, density of uh, plant density? Is it those bare spots are closing in? Yeah, mostly you know because these are are intermediate crested fields. Uh, it's mostly just plant density and uh, the uh, better litter that's holding moisture, um, and the plants are healthier. And so we're, we're getting growth, even when it's dry, getting some growth. Uh, some of these fields, I'm starting to see uh, some warm seasons come in, like Cytos grama is, is starting to come into some of them. So the, the process has begun. Now, honestly, I wish back, you know, 20 years ago, I would have put a, a mix of a native mix in those fields and had them back to native. And we did in, in some of them, uh, but most of it, you know, and so it's a mix, you know, some, some, some pasture we put back to native and some to, to a crested intermediate and alfalfa. And, uh, but uh, there's quite a bit of farm ground in our place that was planted back to natives to Western wheatgrass mix in the seventies and sixties. And uh, those are doing very well. Matching your journey and my journey. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, is, there a, is there a right and a wrong way to waste grass, quote unquote, waste grass? Because I think we're wasting a lot of grass this year. And I don't know if there's going to be much leaf matter left by the time the grasshoppers get through it, or if it'll just mm -hmm. be stalks and heads left. <laughs> Yeah. But is is there a, do you think there's a right and a wrong way to to get that grass laid back down on the soil surface? Uh, let me go back to uh, you know to the um, high production model versus nature's model. Another way to look at that, and Riley Kammerer has pointed this out to me, and it reminds me of how important this is in in the journey that I'm on of working with nature is that the difference, you know, between um, quality and quantity. 
So in a high production model, you constantly focus on quality. So we want quality alpha alpha. We want to put up at the right time and we want to get that into our calves in the winter and fed properly. And we want what we, the, the hay, if we put this up as hay, we have higher quality feed rather than have them graze it. Well, that's not a very uh, soil health uh, kind of a model. Uh, so in order to do what nature wants us to do for a, for a healthy soil, I've had to start thinking more in terms of quantity rather than quality. And how that leads into your question is that uh, you're, you're, we can't ever be everywhere at the exact time this grass is the most palatable, these plants or forbs. And so what we, what, what we do is we just have a grazing plan and we set it up and follow this grazing plan as close as, as is, is, is common sense of lettuce. And, uh, and then, and, and we, we look back behind us and say, wow, we left some grass there or we took too much there this year or whatever. That's not an, that's not a, a big problem. Um, we, the, the, there's a wildlife component that benefits from short grass and tall grass. And, and once you start saying, okay, but I'm going to be there next year at a different time and I'll leave more next year. And this, there's more there in this back paddock now this year than I, I wish I'd have grazed it harder. Well, that might be where you, you'll get your most growth or your most soil health uh, thing just because you're going to catch a bunch of snow, you know, this, this, that would also be a wonderful opportunity next year to go for two weeks, four times a day, you know, and that's all you do that year. That's the only, everything else is a slow move, but you go really fast move there with polywire. Those are opportunities that start presenting themselves when you start watching nature. Dave Stefan often use the term pasture time, that you, it's never a waste to be out in your pasture looking at what the cattle are eating, what the plants are doing, how they're responding to your, to your, your, your grazing strategies, and, and keep asking, how could I do this better? What could I do that would, that would make this uh, 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 more productive or better, healthier? Or, and, uh, and it takes time. This is a this is a journey, and it's going to take. It's a lifelong thing, and uh, um, so uh, it it, it uh, but it it it's a happy, a very pleasant uh, journey. Logan Perbino, um I don't know if this was an Allen Nation quote or not, but he said the best thing that a farmer can add to his field, or the best fertilizer a farmer can add to his field, is his shadow. So. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that's a good that. way yeah that's pasture time yep exactly yeah. yeah um you know dan you and i could talk for a long time <laughs> about these things um but is there any any pieces that you really feel like we need to cover before we uh wrap up today you know it's hard to it's hard to pick one um you know we talked about utilization a little bit and um this this whole uh as as we start uh, subdividing pastures and start focusing on what we're going to use, what we're going to leave. The, the, the recovery is, is a really vital part of this. 80% uh, utilization isn't, uh, isn't damaging. It's coming back too soon. That's damaging. And this is what, you, you know, the participants of the grazing school learn is that, that uh, we have to match utilization to your grazing plan. And how long are you going to, are, are you, is this rest going to be? If it's nine months, then our utilization has to be lower. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's, if it's two years, utilization can be higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something you, that people and all of us that are doing this figure out on our own ranches because our own, our ranches are, the principles are the same. Every ranch is unique. Yep. And history context. I think that's a really great service that um, Gabe Brown and the guys at Understanding Ag have have done is to add that sixth principle of soil health 
of context. What's the history of management? What's the right. neighborhood? You know, right. all of those things really do play a role. And and you know, I've got a spot. <laughs> Every time we drive across it in the side by side, my wife and I, we go whoop. <laughs> it was a mistake from last year where we took too much. Um, but if we don't come back, you know, for two years, we didn't take too much. You know, it just it was it was more than we would have taken if we. Uh, if things had gone according to our our hopes, but we, if we let it rest for two years and and come back to it at a different time, you know, it's going to be, it'll probably be better for it. So, one of the pasture walks I've been on with Alan Savory, uh, he he was thinking about this at that pasture walk because just about every question that was asked him, he said, first let's explore the context. Mm. So we can't answer the, I can't answer the question until I understand, you know, so then, and that, then it becomes a discussion. And uh, yep. I think that's where we start learning. Yep. Very, very good. Dan, um, anything you'd like to share as far as um, opportunities through the Grassland Coalition or, or anything like that? I'm, I'm assuming the Grassland Coalition welcomes people from out of the state. I think we probably still routinely get listeners from almost every state and a few countries <laughs> outside of yes. the states. Uh, of but yeah. but uh, anything that you'd like to share uh, specifics and, and um, I know it's kind of late for some of the grazing schools that you guys have this year, but kind of times of the year that people could look forward to uh, participating in a, in a grazing school or some other event that you guys have going on. Yes. And there's a calendar of events on our website at uh, um, um, what, what is it? sdgrass.net. I .org, I think, right? Or is it not? Okay, yeah, thank you. <laughs> we'll just um, say it'll be in the show notes page for today, workingcows.net slash 251. Workingcows.net slash 251. There'll be a link to the South Dakota Grassland Coalition and, and a link to their calendar of events. Yeah, and um, um, we've got two grazing schools coming up. Uh, one at near Watertown, um, it would be a week from Monday, week from Tuesday, coming Tuesday, which would be, what are the dates? Maybe the, the dates are on the calendar, but the last week of July. And then there's um, there's a grazing school in Chamberlain, the middle of September. And there are pasture walks ongoing through the summer. They're on the calendar on the website. And then uh, um, we just finished the ranching for profit young adult school uh, north of Huron last this week that was yesterday we finished that up and that will be uh, an opportunity next year we're going West River one year and East River the next so we'll be back West River uh, and um, and and HRM um, there will be some HRM schools will, will be probably this winter uh, I don't have Dr. Tom Nossinger lined up for a uh, for a, a workshop yet because we're still working through the, the grant um, deliverables, and uh, we'll know more in a in a couple of months. But uh, I'm, he'll be back, and uh, and most likely he'll be at the Wall Grazing School next summer. He's been at the last two, and uh, we learned a lot from him. Yeah. Yeah, that would, that yeah, that's that's worth the price of admission right there. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, yeah. yeah, so that this is due out uh, July twenty fifth, Lord willing. Um, but so it would be the day before the East River Grazing School starts. So if you happen to be mm-hmm. in the neighborhood and there's still room, you know, you can you can yeah. look that up. Yeah. But then it gives you a, a couple of months uh, before the uh, Chamberlain Grazing School. And uh, like I said, links to all that will be in the show notes page at workingcows.net slash 251. So, uh, Dan, anything else today? Um, of course, like I said, we just scratched the surface, but we can we can always have another conversation at another time. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, education is the key to, uh, to progress. And uh, um, <clears throat> for those of us that struggle to find places to get go to for in the 90s um, those places are available now those schools are out there and uh, it's it's a very good way to avoid making some really big mistakes that are costly and it's a very good way to learn uh, to, to establish an action plan 
that where you learn what you actually are after, what are your goals? And those are, that's, that's the key to, uh, to making progress uh, is to under, understand and, and define your goals. You yeah. Target. Yep. Very good. I appreciate that. Very good. Uh, Dan, thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun. Very good stuff there with Dan. Really appreciated that. Um, and I, I, I have been trying to be more intentional about capturing bon- bonus content uh, with every guest. So if you if you want to hear some more from Dan, uh, feel free to hop out on over to patreon.com slash working cows and uh, catch the bonus content there. I bring that up because I've also got some bonus content with my guests from a couple of weeks from now. Uh, Jared Lumen, uh, of course, of the Herd Quitter podcast fame. Uh, very good podcast he's doing there. Really appreciate those conversations as well. Uh, going to be talking to him kind of about taking taking advantage or figuring out what your regional advantage is and taking advantage of your unfair regional advantage uh, coming up on there. But I've also got some uh, recording in the bonus content from that episode where he told me to release an episode that I've been ruminating on for a while, a solo episode called Red Pills for Ranchers. So um, that's going to be coming your way in in the next couple of weeks, maybe, uh, maybe before, maybe right after Jared's episode. So uh, one or the other will be my episode next week, Lord willing. So look forward to recent, releasing that and uh, look forward to some upcoming conversations uh, with Mary Jo Ehrman and, and some others that I've got in the works. So uh, very good. Looking forward to uh, the next, as I said, Lord willing, the next 250 episodes of the Working Cows podcast, but episode 252 will be coming your way real soon. We'll see you then. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.